Okay, we're going to call to order the uh, Board of Trustees meeting of Oxford University. Uh, any uh, roll call? Christy Atkins. Here. Christy Canada. Here. Christy Jenkins. Here. Christy Knight. Present. Christy May is absent. Christy Miller. Here. Christy O'Malley. Here. Christy McGinnis. Here. Christy Rowe is absent. Trustee Simler. Here. You have a quorum. Okay. Trustees, please note that there are items on your agenda that need to be adopted. Before I call for a vote, are there any items that you wish to extract it from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I move for adopting the agenda, including the consent agenda items. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Okay, the agenda is adopted. The minutes of the June 9th, 2023 board meeting were circulated in advance. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Hearing none, I move to approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are approved. In accordance with Tennessee law, if there had been requests from the public to address the board, it would occur at this point in the meeting. However, the board did not receive any requests, so we will move on to the next agenda item. At this time, I recognize President Lakari, who will introduce today's campus spotlight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chad Brooks, who serves as the Vice Provost and Dean for the College of Graduate Studies here at Austin Peay. Dr. Brooks earned his doctorate from the University of Oklahoma and joined Austin P. in 2005 as an assistant professor of biology. He became vice provost and dean in 2016. And during his career here at Austin P. has published and presented over 30 scholarly works and has been awarded over 70 grants worth more than $80 million. One additional little item is that he lives on a small farm here in Clarksville with his wife, two kids, and nine chickens. <laughs> Dr. Brooks. Bless you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and it's a pleasure and it's a great honor to represent so many wonderful people here at Austin P and tell you just a few great things going on uh, to share with you today. Wait for the slides to pop up. Have control. Uh, I was told by uh, unanimously by PR that this was the best picture of me. Um, <laughs> you can part. Uh, now, I have a lot of folks to recognize because uh, there's just so many people who play a valuable role in the College of Graduate Studies. And I'm also going to talk today a little bit about the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, more affectionately known as the Grants Office. All right. And so I have a lot of people to share. Uh, uh, kudos with, but I'm just going to pick on just a few today who are with me today. Helps if I turn this on. And uh, I serve as the director for the Office of Research and Sponsor Programs. I'm also the chief compliance officer. But with me today is Kelly Pitts, a two time alum of Austin P, and she's the assistant director of Office of Research and Sponsor Programs. Uh, you can do your little wave. She's in the Austin P camo back there. And then we also have Sharada Jones. She's the grant specialist. She joined Austin P just six months ago. There she is. And uh, Karen Rennie, who's at home right now, she is the grant accountant and she's the numbers person for the university. And the College Graduate Studies, I serve as Dean, and working with me uh, is the Associate Dean, with Dr. Wes Atkinson. He's teaching class right now, but he's a professor in languages and literature. And my uh, fantasy football Super Bowl quarterback, Megan Mitchell, is the Director for Graduate Admissions and Recruitment. And uh, she's also an alumni of Austin P. And as soon you're gonna see how her education has played a valuable role here at Austin P. because she earned her master's in communication with uh, marketing as her concentration. And she's the chief marketeer for Austin P. for private school. And working with her is Allison Morris and Sydney March. These dynamic duo, they touch and talk with over a thousand plus uh, graduate students and prospective graduate students every year, and they touch over 16,000 digital artifacts, moving those artifacts into the right folders for faculty to review them for admission. So in the graduate school, faculty and students, okay? 
And I serve as the chair of the Graduate Academic Council, which is the largest standing uh, committee here at Austin P. And it serves as the gatekeepers or managers for all the policies and all academic curricula that impact student success at the graduate level. And uh, President Lacari can hopefully echo what I say. This is a fantastic job because I get to help facilitate and manage a university within a university because we touch physical plant, we touch um, campus security, uh, the Bursar, Student Cal Services. There's so many players. I can't mention them all, but it's just a great group of people to work with. In the Graduate Academic Council, we have 28 graduate coordinators who basically act as chairs and they also as hiring managers, like a, their own HR department, where we um, hire graduate assistantships, over 250 and spread them across our campus as these folks get internship-like experience, real-world experiences on their academic journey. So what does the college graduate studies do? Well, we start at, at the very beginning in marketing, all right? And so Megan Mitchell works closely with the PR department to generate these marketing assets you see here, just a few. And on the left-hand side, we have a digital asset that was in the National Business Journal. And on the right-hand side, you see one of the many creatives that we would launch in various uh, social media venues like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. And uh, one of the common criticisms or limitations I get from my fellow faculty is, Chad, we never see your marketing assets. And I'm like, good, you're not supposed to, <laughs> right? Uh, these marketing assets are launched in a very strategic way for a very specific profile so that when these assets are received by those particular prospective students, they'll have the right appetite in their career journey to want to want to click on it, raise their hand and ask for more information. And of course, if you happen to drive down the corridor between Clarksville, Nashville, and Murfreesboro, you'll see many of the billboards that have been strategically placed to just to remind people of the brand identity and who we are as Austin P. Well, numbers will speak for themselves here. This chart on the far left-hand side begins with the first week in January, second week in January, and so on to your right. And this graphic just shows the number of applications that we receive, that we receive aggregated uh, over time. And just last week, we've we have a 20%, almost 20% increase in graduate applications. The black line is last year, the gray line is the year before that, the blue line is the year before that, and the yellow line is before that. And this, we have data going back to 2011. I like to suggest or say that we are very strategic in the way that we are fine tuning how we launch our digital assets to make sure it meets people where they are in their life journey and let them know that Austin P is the next step for them. Now, getting people to see their digital assets and raise their hand and talk to them, we try to hand them off very quickly to faculty because faculty are the best ambassadors about the graduate programs we have here. They are the experts. But them receiving those digital assets and them clicking and raising their hand is one thing. Getting them enrolled is, a, is another thing. And so you can see over the past few years, we have witnessed an ace, a 68, sorry, 66 percent increase in graduate enrollment. And this is because, first off, I suggest to you that we are doing a more strategic job in launching our marketing assets, but we're also bringing relevant graduate programs to a market need. Back in 2016, we had 47 graduate different graduate program offerings, and now we have 84. Truly, it is the case that being mindful and using Hannibal Research and other types of assessments, we identify the right graduate program for our market need. We are the anchor university for Middle North Tennessee. Now, getting in the role is great, but we're here to graduate students. Over the past few years, we have seen an 87% increase in students walking across the stage. And that's a fantastic imp impact to our state's economy because on average, the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that graduate students tend to earn somewhere between 25 and 30% more over their lifetime than a person without a graduate degree. And that's fantastic for the state of Tennessee. It's fantastic for their families because it empowers greater social mobility. However, I'm gonna pack upon you one other idea. Most of the people who go to graduate school are moms and dads, and they're showing their children that they are able to balance work, mom and dadness, and earning a graduate degree. They are fantastic role models for their family and friends. That's what Austin P is doing, is we're changing and helping those families become more socially nimble uh, and, and economic nimble and on average, kids who graduate from moms and dads who have graduate degrees go on to do great things undergraduately and graduately. Now, everybody in this room knows that 
Since the appropriate state funding to universities of higher education based upon a, formula, a funding formula that's mostly student success metrics based. The college graduate studies metric is completely graduation rate, and the college graduate studies represents a little bit more than 14% of state appropriations and student success funding. Uh, out of the $76 million that Tennessee Higher Education Commission recommended for appropriation, the college graduate studies uh, earned, or rather the faculty in the university earned, $11 million of that. Now I'm going to switch gears for a second, and it's going to be a little bit bizarre for some folks, but I'm going to talk about the Office of Research and Sponsor Programs, another hat that I wear. This model is a very common model across the nation where the grad studies dean and the Office of Research official are the same person, and the synergy is fantastic uh, because a lot of your high-end researchers are also teach graduate school. So what does the grants office do? You can think of the grants office in two ways. We have before you get a grant and after you get a grant. We call this the pre-award and post-award. So the grants office puts on workshops for our faculty and staff to educate them about how to apply for a grant. We identify funding opportunities and share that with the campus weekly. We make sure that we're eligible. And as Blaine Clements will tell you, we make sure that we're compliant with all the federal and state regulations. We also identify collaborators, uh, either internally in Austin P or uh, across the nation. And of course, we apply for funding. On the post award side, also known as managing a grant, we build every single budget. We work with program officers, also known as grantors, the all powerful folks, and we also render sub awards and contracts. We do all that in house. We hire personnel, we render scholarships, stipends, and again, we monitor all compliance reporting. Every grant has a compliance piece, and every grant has a compliance report. And we also manage and make sure that we follow all of the domestic and international regulations in terms of travel. Now, grant offices are oftentimes measured in two ways. One of the ways is shown by this illustration is the amount of external dollars available to be spent in any physical year. In physical year 23, Austin P was able to spend almost $12 million on all kinds of initiatives, initiatives that impact our students, faculty, staff, as well as our community. And you can see that we've had basically a 353% increase since fiscal year 16. And people often ask, you know, how is this possible? And I suggest to you it's because we're much more strategic in the way that we go for grants. We utilize, utilize our time to pick grants that we think Austin P can win and also most importantly align with our university mission. Right now we have 138 active grants on our campus impacting students and faculty and community alike. Another way grant offices are evaluated is basically their grant portfolio that they have for the next five years. And so for the next five years, Austin P has $47.5 million to spend on all kinds of initiatives. And this is a 485% increase since fiscal year 16. Now, I have so many stories to share. I'm just going to pick two to illustrate how these grants align with Austin P's mission as well as impacting the community. One of the first ones I'd like to share is a grant that we received last year from uh, the state of Tennessee. It's a $200,000 grant that is a research grant in which our students from the Psychological Sciences and Counseling Department, they're, they're the ones who earn the grant, they take their student counselors and embed them in places across our campus, as well as the Newton Military Resource Center, as well as Fort Campbell, but also in our local TCAP. And they meet with veterans routinely throughout the week, and they're measuring how veterans learn, how they learn, all right? So this is a research grant, but also this grant serves our community. But also this grant helps our students gain real life hands-on interactions in a career that they're about to have. And they're under supervision of our qualified faculty, of course. This is the trifecta of grants because it's meeting our uh, university strategic plan and three different pillars all at the same time. And also the grant pays for the whole thing. So this is a super win. It's a great project. And uh, of course, serving our veterans. Another one I'd like to highlight is someone from my home department and from the Department of Biology, Dr. Kyle Benowitz, uh, assistant professor. He won the Super Bowl of NSF grants. He won the Early Career Grant Award. 
everybody who is a scientist wants this particular grant and he earned it. For, so for the next five years, he and his students will have the money to do his research on evolutionary genomics and insect behavior. Here you're seeing him leading a summer camp with some elementary school kids and he's showing some bugs and they're having fun and they're having fun while they're learning. So congratulations to Kyle. What a great award and what a great testament to the type of people Austin P can attract and hire. This is actually my favorite slide. Red Mallers do amazing things because more than a thousand students on our campus in the past six years that we can actually enumerate and count, by the way, uh, have been impacted by these grants. They have gotten to work in research labs. They have gotten to go and study abroad trips. They have gotten to do service learning. They have gotten to do things that actually will put on their resume as a stepping stone beyond Austin Peay. Also, these grants impact our community. Over 8,000 high school students receive college preparatory support, TID4 calculators, and other type of things to improve their likelihood of being successful in their next step, being in Austin P, and we hope it is, but any university, any community college across the state. This is what these grants do. They change lives. Well, I said uh, quite a bit of things, and there's a, I'm really excited to say more, but I've been told that I cannot be a professor and talk for two hours, so <laughs> I am done. <laughs> and I welcome any questions you might have. Great presentation, Dr. Brooke. Yeah. Great job. So much. Good. Thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to action items. <clears throat> we need the Academic Affairs Committee report. I recognize Trustee O'Malley to give us this report. Thank you, Don, and thank you for the opportunity to present my report from this morning's Academic Affairs Committee meeting. We approved the minutes from the June 9th, 2023 Academic Affairs Committee meeting. And then we reviewed and approved the following action item, which was approved today on the consent agenda. Consideration of revisions to policy 1-025 academic tenure. Provost Cromley pre presented the following information items, degree and certificate awards by type and academic year, program productivity report, preliminary fall enrollment, and letter of notification to THEC about the master of athletic training. That concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee O'Malley. <clears throat> I recognize Trustee McGinnis, Chair of the Student Affairs Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to present my report from this morning's Student Affairs Committee meeting. The committee met and approved the minutes from the June 9, 2023 committee meeting. There were no action items on the agenda. Vice President of Student Affairs, Dr. Leonard Clements, presented the following information items. Student Affairs Strategic Vision and Dining Renovations. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee McGinnis. Next, we have uh, Trustee Kanata, Chairman of the Business and Finance Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to present my report from this morning's Business and Finance Committee meeting. The committee met and approved the minutes from the June 9th, 2023 committee meeting. No other action items were considered, and there were no informational items. Thank you, Trustee Kanata, for your brief report. <laughs> okay, now we're going to the Executive Committee report. Thank you for the opportunity to present my report from this morning's meeting. The committee approved the minutes from the June 9, 2023 Executive Committee meeting. The committee reviewed and approved one action item, which you approved today by consent, Policy 1015, Internal Audit. The committee also reviewed and approved one additional action item, which I will now present for your review and action. The institutional mission profile statement was provided to you in advance of this meeting. By direction of the executive committee, I move that we approve the institutional mission profile statement. Since this is a motion of the committee, a second is not required. Is there discussion? Hearing none, 
Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Here. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee McInnes? Yes. Trustee Simler? Yes. The motion carries. Next, we go to the audit committee report. I recognize Trustee Mueller, chairman of the audit committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to present my report from today's audit committee meeting. The committee approved the minutes from the June 9th, 2023 audit committee meeting and audit committee executive session. The committee also reviewed and approved the internal audit salaries and budget for FY 2024. Mr. Clements presented the following information items. A, the internal audit reports issued between May 12th, 2023 and August 17th, 2023 with a list of outstanding audit recommendations. B, the Office of Internal Audit 2023 annual report. C, the overview of recently completed external review. And D, update on the quality assurance review of the Office of Internal Audit. That concludes my report of the audit committee meeting. Thank you, Trustee Miller. Under other business, we have the naming request for the O'Malley Family Welcome Center. The next agenda item is a naming request for the O'Malley Family Welcome Center. I invite Mr. Chris Phillips, Vice President for Alumni, Engagement, Philanthropy, and Executive Director of the ABSU Foundation to provide more information about this agenda item. Thank you, Chairman Jenkins, and thanks to each of you on the trustees for your service. You really are leading us boldly as we head towards our centennial and enhancing the guts for life experience that we really try to establish with all our alumni and friends. When I'm here today is typically is when we have secured a gift with the university that garners stewardship at the naming level. And I'm very proud today to say in accordance with APSU naming policy 7009, the naming committee met and the members recommend that the Austin P State University Welcome Center located right here at 317 College Street, formerly known as the Honda Building, be named after the O'Malley family in honor of their generous gift to Austin P and to APSU trustee Michael O'Malley's service to the university. The renovation of the outside here area will be 5,800 square feet. We'll convert the former car showroom and dealership into the university's welcome center. After completion, this facility will become a starting point for future students and visitors to meet with admissions officers, financial and academic advisors and tour the campus. And after the numbers you heard this morning, it's much needed. <laughs> Construction is estimated to start in December, and the project is to projected, I use that word all the time, projected to be completed in the fall of 2024. The University Welcome Center will be one of the anchors to the university's growth as we become more entrenched in the downtown Clark's recorder. And I would be proud to say, as you look at that, will become the beacon of red. <laughs> The name is the O'Malley Family Welcome Center. The full minutes from the meeting and the full bio of Michael O'Malley and his family can be found in your pockets. Though you all know him very well, I would like to say a little bit about Mr. O'Malley and his family. He is a U.S. Air Force veteran. He graduated from Ohio University before relocating to Clark Still to work for Wendy's of Bowling Green, a franchise operating 18 restaurants. In 1990, Mike's involvement involved a partnership where he was a key franchise expansion to 56 Wendy's across the country, spanning multiple states. In 2012, he ascended to the position of CEO and senior partner at Wendy's of Bowling Green, presiding over a company that earned an array of Wendy's accolades. Today, there are 135 Wendy's that puts his company in the top 10 in the country from Wendy's. Since 1998, the O'Malley family had recognized the value of contributions to Austin D. and Clark's Montgomery County and the surrounding area. Their continued dedication and support for Austin P were highlighted by O'Malley's tenure as the chairman as the Austin P Foundation and his memberships in the President's Giving Tower and the Redcoat Society. In 2017, Governor Haslam appointed the inaugural Austin P State University Board of Trustees, and Mr. O'Malley was chosen and elected to the board to be the inaugural chair, which he served for two terms. He currently serves as your vice chair, and, and recently, Governor Lee renewed his appointment to the board until 2028. O'Malley and his wife, Jane, have participated in many university, athletic, and military initiatives. They have raised two sons, Ryan and Sean, and have two grandchildren. 
Sean is a gut for life. He graduated in 2009 from the College of Business, and he and Ryan also both work for Wendy's. So that is the committee's recommendation, proud recommendation to name the Austin P. Family, O'Malley Family Welcome Center. Thank you. You've heard the explanation from Mr. Phillips. Do I hear a motion to approve the naming request? Chairman, to make the motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. That we approve the naming request the O'Malley Family Welcome Center. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to thank Mr. O'Malley. I'm sure everybody around here thanks you. And I, that rendering is beautiful. It is. So excited. Both Little that I know when I used to bring my Honda around the back for service. <laughs> <laughs> sitting here today. So it does look good in red, though. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Thank you. So, like I'm, uh, I'm very happy that the building's going to turn from uh, from blue to red. Uh, I've been giving Chris Phillips a hard time every time I see him, and also Mike Lacari about the fact that the outside of this building at least need to be painted red if the inside was blue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am uh, thrilled. I think this is going to be an incredible addition. And uh, Mike, we really appreciate everything that you do for Austin P. All the time, he's been a uh, uh, a lifetime supporter of Austin P, and has just done an incredible job at this university. Let's give Mike a hand. Okay. Uh, point of order, did you all vote? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Phillips, and thank you very much, Mike. Now I recognize Mr. Mark Brenner, Director of Capital Planning, Design and Construction, and Mr. Art Litsky of Litsky and Matthew to provide an update on the master plan. Thank you and good morning. Um, every 10 years, Tennessee Higher Education Commission requires the universities to complete a master plan. Master plan charts a course for future development of physical space, facilities, condition assessments, and space utilization. In February of this year, um, after a, an extensive national search and evaluation by a team of stakeholders across campus, the university hired uh, Doberlitsky Mathy out of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Art and his team completed the 2013 master plan and the 2017 master plan also. He has 50 years experience, almost uh, at, having done the same sort of thing in nearly um, 500 institutions in 47 states, one U.S. territory, and um, 26 countries. So he is uh, well-versed in this topic, and um, he brings a lot of talent. And right now, he's currently working for Tennessee Higher Education Commission to, complete, uh, to review and complete an update to their space study. So with that, I introduce Art Litsky of um, Dober Litsky Mathy. Thank you. Let's see. So this is um, really just going to give you a status report. We are maybe about a third of the way into the campus planning process. Can you hear me, Carol? It could be a little louder. Yes. All right. Sorry, I've got a, a low voice. Um, we have, it, it is a um, fairly participatory process, I think. We've been meeting with a lot of different folks over the last several months. This is a sort of a listing of the folks that we met with originally um, in areas of the campus that we've we've touched base with. Um, there are, I don't know, maybe about 20 different groups on campus that we've met with so far. Uh, this week, we've been meeting with all the department chairs of the academic programs, trying to understand the nature of their, their activity, how they're working with their students, trying to understand the nature of their research and what their facility needs might be. We plan to meet with students, student government and student uh, activities and so on to learn more from their perspective because they see this campus differently from than you all do. Uh, they're living here, they're working here, they're touching base here, and they are your clients. And so um, it's important to get their point of view also about what, what's needed in the future. So essentially, um, it is a 
five step process that we're, that we're involved with. These are the different steps along the way. It starts with a variety of assumptions that we're trying to understand now. What's the nature of this campus and where is it going? Uh, step two is looking at three different types of studies. One is, again, talking to folks about the program, the curriculum, uh, how they work with their students and so on. Another is to look at each building to understand how, uh, what the conditions are, understand who is in what building, where they are, do they have enough space and so on. We're looking at space, classroom utilization and laboratory utilization and office utilization and so on. We're um, just trying to understand how you are using your spaces and are they appropriate to the way in which they're being used today. We're also looking at the overall campus, the location of the buildings, the way in which the roads and circulation patterns mix, bring everybody together and so on. And those are the three different sort of analyses that are going on as we speak right now. That leads us to step three, which is to take all of this information and present to you what we have found out, the things that we think are important for you to understand, the things that we think are um, are problem areas that need to be addressed in one way or the other. Um, and we have, we'll have a, I think a really long list of things that you won't be able to afford, that you won't be able to do. <laughs> so it could be important to take that long list and prioritize it. And, you, and, and that's a, a, an essential part of this whole process. What's the most important things that you feel need to be addressed that should move forward? I don't think we've ever worked with any institution where we had a list that they could actually do entirely. It can't be done. There's lots of different problems that need to be addressed from minor little things to big pushes up to, to fulfill your vision and so on. So we'll also be doing benchmarking, comparing it to some other institutions. We need to apply the THEAD guidelines in one way or the other. But at some point, there'll be a list of things that you feel should be addressed in the master plan. And that then goes into step four, which is looking at alternatives for meeting those needs. What are the different, the different ways in which you can take those long years and solve those problems? Some combination of renovation, reconstruction, some reallocation of space, and so on. And that eventually will become the master plan. It's a five step process, it never happens this way. Uh, it's, it's iterative, we go back and forth and back and forth. I'd like to say it's a nine to 12 month process, but there might be something and some reason why you need more time to talk about internally a decision that needs more time and we'll just make it work until you are comfortable with uh, the, the proposals that are going forward. So um, let me just uh, say that here's where we are in that red box. We're in the second and third step. We're still analyzing the campus. We're still creating the findings. We have started the utilization study. Um, and that's where we are. So the next time we meet, if we meet sometime in the winter time, I'll give you some idea of some of the alternatives that, that we might be exploring and, and, and help you understand where we are at that point. So um, there is a building that is going to be incorporated in the master plan that started before we started the campus plan. It's a good idea, the multidisciplinary academic building. Uh, it consists of um, sports broadcasting from, from the College of, of Arts and, and, uh, and Science, Colony Arts and Reserve Offices Training Corps, Institute for National Security and Military Studies. These are four academic programs that by themselves are too small for a, a new facility. They all need new, more space. But combining them it makes sense because there are spaces that each of them have that the others can share and can, can take advantage of. So this is one building that I think is going to move forward in the master plan as it moves forward. Um, and it, it'll, there'll be some others that will come out of this as we, as we go ahead. And that's where we are. It's the status report. Um, we have just really started to uh, look at more carefully how to address some of those needs and we'll get you informed. I'll answer any questions you might have. I'll listen to any concerns you might have. It's interesting that you had uh, been involved in this process in 2013 and 2017, 
and it makes sense that you're back, you know, to follow up on those. Do you find typically that condition or, or do conditions change sufficiently that, in other words, is there a project that you identified in 2013 that showed up in 17 and is going to be on 24 or do things change Sorry, significantly? Man. I would love to see something happen to Marks. It's one building that I would love to see. <laughs> so so there, there are um, problems that I saw in 2013 that I still see today. Freyhern still needs attention. There are some of your academic buildings still need the same attention that I saw in 2013. Um, you have new arts building. You have a professional health facility coming, coming along. Those were part of the earlier plans, and I'm glad to see that they have moved forward. Um, when things happen slowly on campuses, sometimes they happen quickly. Usually it's slow. And in a public institution, um, decisions take longer sometimes than you would hope they would. Yeah, there are buildings that I like to see change. I've some, some campus improvements that I have been talking about for a long time, and we'll see, we'll continue to include them. Maybe things will change because we have an individual board representing the university right. now that we didn't have in the previous right. studies. And before you were under right. and now you're even longer, and things can change that way. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you for your comments. Two questions. One is Do you think that we will get the full campus plan, your recommendations, by next? Spring probably because obviously December is too aggressive. I think based on what you've said, I I, I think that uh, once there is something that needs you know longer conversation, a a period is a good time period to think about. We would present to you a draft plan that you would then vote on or then then, then talk about in in more more detail. So that, that's a good time frame. So we're looking at probably next June's meeting, probably. And then the second thing, it dovetails on what Mr. O'Malley said, is that with the needs that have been identified historically, and I guess maybe it may not be a question for you, but maybe for the president about incorporating that in with the fundraising efforts at the university, because we have, of course, done some great naming of buildings. But if these needs have been, and this is pre-U, they were identified, but I'm thinking about the fundraising efforts for the university and naming, that perhaps those could be earmarked, potentially depending on what a donor's appetite is for some of these needs. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, the uh, that's a really good that's a really good point. In fact, um, any uh, any state appropriations usually is going to come with opportunities to uh, to to fundraise. Uh, or renovations to existing facilities um, sometimes are made possible entirely because of uh, a, a generous gift. You know, we're sitting in, the, in in what's going to be the Welcome Center as a result of, you know, a very generous gift uh, and no state dollars, you know, extra capital uh, dollars. So, yes, exactly right. Um, I think going forward, uh, we have an opportunity to leverage those those uh those philanthropic dollars probably in 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 more aggressive ways. Thank you. Any further questions? Well thank you, Mark and Art, thank you for your great presentation. We appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you in June. The next item on our agenda is strategic plan update. President Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Jenkins. Uh, as you know, uh, Ms. Whiteside provided leadership uh, over the last year to uh, to develop the university's strategic plan, Experience Austin P. Uh, and uh, we are now, uh, through her leadership, and uh, uh, working on the implementation of the plan. Uh, I gave some remarks uh, about the, the status of our implementation implementation of the plan at my convocation address uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the semester, uh, and commented that uh, the stereotypical plan is one that is uh, developed and then shelved, never to be seen again. 
uh, until it's time to read your plan. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, and I'm very proud to be able to say that uh, and uh, thankful for uh, Danelle's leadership on making sure that uh, we have a living and breathing uh, strategic plan here at the university that is causing a lot of action and activity. So uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Whiteson. Thank you, President Lakari, and I'm excited to share with you all the year one update of the plan, Experience Austin P. Um, <clears throat> again, we're, we're here from 2022 to 2027, which I'm excited because 2027, as you all know, is our centennial. So it's my hope that we'll be able to have to have met all of these goals and tied it up in a nice bow and have a really big celebration. So um, let me remind you of our mission, which you all approved in June of last year. I love to hang on to mission driven and community minded because that's really driving how we are moving forward. A reminder also of our vision as being the region's university of choice for those seeking to improve their lives. We don't want to just be the safe school. We want to be the first school that they think about when they choose to pursue a post-secondary credential. And then our values, um, collaboration, personal growth, lifelong engagement, integrity, and academic excellence. What I really hope is that you will start to see that the things that we are doing are directly tied to our mission, our vision, our values, and our plan. Some things that I'll highlight on that are, first of all, we have some cards now called values cards called caught you showing our values. So we've handed these out to leaders across campus. And so when they see someone who is showing their values, they will are showing our values we will, that, that person can write a note, give it to that individual, and the individual will be eligible for a quarterly drawing for a prize. So those are the ways that, one of the ways that we're trying to continue to hit home who we are and encourage people to embody those. Also, APSC 1000, which is the course that all first year students take is sort of like an orientation to college. Uh, has organized their class structure around the four pillars of our strategic plan. And so, as you can see, we are finding places of synergy across campus, which is really exciting. And we're being very intentional about that. So, as you may recall, this body approved the pillars, goals, and objectives in June of last year. And then the pillar champions and their teams broke back out and worked on their specific tactics to support the plan. In other words, what will be the specific measurable steps that we will take to accomplish the goal and objective that you approved. And so at its retreat, the, the following board, following the board meeting, the senior leadership team decided which goals that we were going to put our best effort and energy behind, also known as wildly important goals, so the WIGs. Uh, and then in February of this year, SLT voted to provide funding for the tactics identified in the WIGs. And I would also want you to point out to you that you have a full copy of the plan, which has all of the tactics that were developed by the various teams. And so when you have a moment, please look over those because it really does talk about the specifics of how we're going to meet our goals. So here's a little bit about the funding and the plan, and it really gives you a breakdown of the specific tactics that received allocation on July 1st of this year. Um, and I, from my perspective, I see many of these as smart investments. For instance, the allocations that we made for the marketing budget, increasing the marketing budget, and the CRM upgrades have helped us to increase our enrollment for this year. Uh, we will continue to do more things, and every year, hopefully, uh, if we continue to have new, have more enrollment and new revenue, then we can continue to fund the plan in a way that makes the most sense for the university. So I'm excited to share with you that we've made significant progress across all four pillars of Austin Peay State University's experience Austin Peay strategic plan since it launched last year. And I will go through this briefly pillar by pillar. So pillar one, the academic experience. The, we've expanded faculty professional development through the CAFE, the Center for Advancement of Faculty Excellence. 
We've implemented a new comprehensive reporting and workflow system for, for faculty productivity. The retention, tenure, and promotion criteria was adjusted to emphasize that we are a teaching university, uh, but also to include research and, and elevated research rigor. We also launched the new university college, which you approved in March and June. Um, the college was launched in on August the 1st with Dr. Legret Legret Legretta Griffey and the new dean. Um, and then expanding research support for uh, faculty to travel to conferences and other things to continue to grow in their professions. Pillar two, the student experience. We've developed a comprehensive strategic enrollment management plan. You all were given a preview of that in some prior meetings. But again, that also highlights how we've been able to be successful in continuing to grow our enrollment. We have expanded tutoring services and support for diverse student populations. We are launching new student engagement initiatives like our People in the Community Day of Service, which will be a university-wide event. Uh, we've also embedded continuous engagement in terms of leadership and teaching our students um, leadership skills. And this attracted the largest attendance that we've seen to date. And also we have, we have significantly expanded Governor's Orientation Weekend. It's been not just the weekend, but spread out through several weeks so that it's not just the bang, you're here and, and after that you're on your own, but that we are trying to create a continuous environment of excitement and student success. The employee experience, we have created some robust professional development and training opportunities um, through a, a collaboration between HR and the Office of Institutional Culture. We are firmly, I believe firmly rooted and, and sort of firmly set now on our flexible work arrangements that that seems to be working and most people are have figured out the best way that it works for them but also we've done a, done it in such a way that we've maintained the campus vibrancy um, and we've also expanded employee resource groups so we have the black faculty and staff association um, there are the women's um, the women's club has revived and so we're we're doing we're doing more things to create a culture of belonging amongst our employees. We've also implemented under Sharus's division a new budget model to empower departmental decision making. We had a town hall a month ago where Sharus laid out his entire plan and strategy for the new budget process. And we got really great feedback about people's thoughts that they feel they feel that they are part of the budget process and it's not just a top-down decision and they know what their budget is and how we got to that. So uh, we're continuing that culture of transparency. We have launched a staff compensation study to ensure that we're paying our staff at a com at competitive levels and we will be making adjustments based on what we find there. And we've instituted a successful new employee and board onboarding orientation process, which every at every it's, it's held once a month. And I just did it um, this this past week, actually this week, and there were about 25 new employees in there. And every time that we meet, every time every month, a member of senior leadership team comes to the orientation to welcome them, which sets a really nice tone. And they are they are exposed to things like, you know, what is a strategic plan? What are we, you know, what's athletics? How, how do I get involved on campus? It's been a really powerful tool to make sure people are, you know, felt like they're welcomed and not just given a packet of forms and policies to read and say, you know, have a nice day, good luck to you. Uh, the final pillar, the community experience. We have established the inaugural campus-wide people in the community day of service. It will be October the 25th. Uh, we are hoping to have at least a thousand people, a thousand people in our community, hands on providing service. And so I really hope that is the week of homecoming, but I hope that you all will 
pitch in. Um, there will be signups and opportunities for both on-campus and off-campus opportunities to serve. We also launched the APSU Leadership Exchange Program, which I have a slide next to show you a little bit about that. Obviously, the consolidated services for military and military military affiliated students under the new vice president for military and veteran affairs. The athletic strategic plan is, is very grounded in enhancing those community partnerships. And of course, um, Chris would be happy to highlight the highest fundraising year in university history. So again, we are making progress. Last week, we launched the first ever leadership exchange and the Leadership Exchange Program is a university level initiative to strengthen community partnerships. This concept is to open our doors to the community and bring in leaders who have control over their organizational strategies. We really want those leaders to come to our campus so that we can think about ways to create new partnerships or to expand existing partnerships. Our first exchange was with leaders of Fort Campbell, including Garrison Commander Colonel Christopher Midbury. He is brand new to his assignment, and so it was really a timely orientation for him on what we offer. And a number of the folks that also visited from Fort Campbell were new to their assignment, so they were really excited to learn about what we do here. And so we already have a special connection with Fort Campbell, and it was really nice to see uh, the dots connect further on, on ways to expand those partnerships. So these are the wildly important goals that the university leadership has selected um, for year one, pillar two, goal two, pillar four, goal two, and pillar three, goal two. And we have significantly improved the strategic pillars, goals, and objectives of the past year. The campus community remains committed to achieving the shared vision outlined in the plan. And we decided as a leadership team this summer that we were going to, going to continue to focus on those particular weeks, even though we're shifting to year two, because we have already started to make progress and we felt like we should continue moving that football down the field rather than pivoting to, to um, provide support on other goals. Uh, and we believe that this creates an empowering employee culture and builds meaningful community partnerships. So uh, at this time, I'm open to questions. I will note that Carol sent you all a video that showed and highlighted the first year of our strategic plan. I hope that you've had a chance to look over that or see the video, but if you haven't already, it's really exciting. So check your inbox because it's in there. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm open to them at this time. Any questions? And now thank you for your report. Uh, if you haven't seen that video, uh, it just reminds you of all the excitement at Austin P right now. And uh, I understand that you all doesn't take very long to do that. It was very professionally no, done. But and, let me shout out. Moving. Yes, let me shout out my incredible public relations and marketing team. Um, one, per one person in particular, Sean McCulley, had this vision. He came to me. He was like, I have this really cool idea. And so he was able to, it's really cool to see someone take an idea in their head and like put it out there in the world. And so it was amazing. Also a um, very collaborative effort because Evan A. Amos is a professor um, of dance and African-American studies. And so she was the narrator um, of the whole project. So it was really, really impactful. And when we, we showed that video at convocation, we got like it was exciting. People were like cheering in the crowd. So it was awesome. It was exciting just from the red earrings alone. <laughs> <laughs> very well done. Any further questions? Just a comment. It's it's very nice and uh, encouraging to see a strategic plan. It's not just sitting on a shelf somewhere. So you're, you're putting it into action and working on it every day. And it's great to see. Thank you. I recognize President Licari to give his report and also report on any interim items. Thank you, Chairman Jenkins. Um, and I'll add my uh, my my thanks to uh, to Danelle and really everybody else on campus for uh, making sure that uh, our strategic plan is not something that's just gathering dust on the shelf, but really and truly guiding uh, the, the work that we're gonna be doing over the next uh, set of years as we close in on our uh, centennial. 
Uh, we are off to a really, really great start in the plan. Uh, and we're really off to a great start in the 2023-24 academic year. Um, you know, we had uh, we had a really fun weekend last weekend over in Knoxville. Uh, our football team played hard, uh, and uh, it did give me a chance to go up and and uh, in the uh, university suite there in Neyland and say hey to uh, Chancellor Plowman and President uh, Boyd when we were up six to three. So that was. <laughs> Just right. Just right. <laughs> um, but we also did some work over there. Um, you know, I, I, I arrived in uh, Knoxville a couple of days early. Uh, we had um, uh, a chance to uh, do uh, some recruiting of new freshman students uh, with an evening event on Thursday. And then I was in one of the local high schools uh, in Knoxville uh, Friday morning speaking to uh, a senior class of uh, of about 540 students. And so uh, I got some really good opportunities to talk to school counselors and students there, uh, as well as families. Uh, we had a wonderful tailgate uh, on Saturday, but the previous night on Friday, we had a great uh, opportunity to get together with alumni and friends. Uh, so it was a very productive uh, weekend as well. Um, as you heard, uh, Provost Cronley, uh, in her enrollment update, uh, provided some wonderful news, you know, to have overall enrollment up uh, more than 7% uh, as of the 14th day is, uh, is a fantastic news. It is absolutely tremendous, and in, in particularly in comparison with the rest of the state. Uh, it is the biggest enrollment increase of all of the uh, LGIs uh, in the state. Uh, we, we right now have record graduate enrollment which is also bucking a statewide trend. Uh, this is the largest freshman class that we've had in recent years. We have a record number of students at the Fort Campbell Center. Uh, kudos to the, to the small but mighty team uh, up on post. Uh, we are up 38% in those students uh, compared to last year. Uh, and so we're blowing the doors off there. We have a record number of dual enrollment students. Uh, and uh, although those don't uh, help us too much in terms of budget, don't look at Sharu's right now, uh, they eventually do because uh, they are one of our best pathways and best best uh, bridges between high school enrollment and, uh, and, and Austin P enrollment. We yield those students at a far higher rate than, uh, than any other applicants. So to have record number of dual enrollment uh, bodes well for the future. We have a record number of honors students. Uh, it's a 16% increase over the number of honors students, uh, in new honor students compared to last year, um, which in, and last year was a record as well. So not only are we getting more students, we're getting really good students. So talented, smart high school students are finding Austin to be uh, their university of choice. Uh, and we opened the semester booked at uh, 86% uh, in terms of housing occupancy, which is up from 73% last year. Uh, and so the residence halls are pretty well full. So a lot of different offices contributed. Uh, the enrollment task force that uh, we established last year pulled together people from across campus, admissions, financial aid, marketing, athletics, alumni, folks from the Division of, uh, of, of Administration of Finance, Military and Veterans Affairs, housing, all of the college deans all worked their tails off uh, in order to get these numbers uh, to be where they are. So I'm incredibly proud uh, of, um, of the team uh, and incredibly proud of all of the uh, faculty and staff across campus. Um, thank you uh, to those who attended the uh, groundbreaking for the Health Professions Building. If you go over there now in the corner of 8th and Marion, uh, it is now a giant hole in the ground, which is great. You got to start with something like that. So they're digging out the foundation. And uh, I purposely will, will go over to that side of campus every once in a while just because I think it's so darn cool. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. Thank you also to those of you who attended the uh, ribbon cutting to name uh, our uh, beach volleyball facility. Uh, and uh, so thank you, uh, Billy, and you, to your family. Uh, that uh, that facility now bears uh, the Atkins family name. So very excited about that. And then, of course, um, work on the uh, new Welcome Center will we'll happen later this, uh, we'll start later this fall. The goal is to have it open by homecoming next fall. Hopefully we'll be able to hit that. Uh, so thank you, Mike, and to your whole family for, um, uh, for, for the support for making that project uh, happen. Um, 
Well, I'll just wrap it up by saying uh, a couple of things. There, there, there are a few priorities that I gave campus. Uh, I gave you the senior leadership team in our, in our, in our retreat and that I mentioned to campus um, in my convocation address. And so I just want to make sure the board hears these priorities as well. Um, in the, in the uh, senior leadership team retreat, uh, I mentioned four key priorities, improving campus vitality, uh, and Dr. Clemens is working very, very hard, very, very quickly to, uh, to improve our energy uh, and engagement uh, on campus with our students. Making sure that community engagement is a two-way street. Uh, and you saw some of those efforts already in, in Danelle's report from the strategic plan. Uh, continuing to push on enrollment, but also beginning to work very, very intentionally on student retention. Uh, and then uh, uh, laying the groundwork, continuing to lay the groundwork to launch our next comprehensive campaign. Uh, all of those four things uh, can be bolstered by uh, uh, successful uh, and energized uh, athletics programs uh, on campus because those will produce campus vitality, they will embed our engagement with the community, um, they will drive enrollment, uh, and of course, athletics is a great source of fundraised dollars. So that was what we talked about in my leadership team retreat. Um, and then at convocation, I made some remarks about what's coming uh, for higher ed in, in the state of Tennessee. Uh, after doing a lot of reading, a lot of conversations with uh, commissioners, uh, a lot of conversation with other university presidents in the state, a lot of conversation with THEC staff, it's pretty clear that uh, the state will uh, begin uh, evaluating universities. We already have the performance funding uh, formula, but I'm uh, convinced that the state will, uh, uh, the next time it's uh, uh, up for review, the formula will change in order to build in post-graduation success metrics. Uh, what are our students accomplishing um, after they graduate from Austin P? Uh, and so we have a little bit of time that that formula won't change for a few years, um, but that's just enough time in order for us to start now uh, change what we're doing if we have to make certain investments where we need to in order to be ready uh, to track and, and, and be uh, and make sure our students are getting the academic co-curricular and extracurricular experiences they need while they're here so that when they graduate, they are successful. Uh, and we're gonna be evaluated on that eventually. And so uh, we might as well start now so that when the formula does change, we're ready. Uh, so that's the, that's the commentary that I gave to campus uh, when, uh, when we convened right before us the, uh, the, the year started. So I wanted to make sure that everybody heard that as well. Uh, to close out, um, your packet does include a list of contracts and agreements that have been executed, uh, State Building Commission actions that have occurred uh, since the last board meeting. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my remarks. Thank you, President Lakari. <clears throat> President Lakari, uh, I'll speak for the board that uh, we appreciate your energy and your passion for Austin P. Uh, I think everybody in this room can feel the excitement around here. You are the spark plug that uh, has uh, sparked lots of changes at Austin P right now. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Dean Simler for your first meeting as a trustee. Yeah. Glad to have you on the board. Uh, and then uh, Leonard Clemens, Vice President for Student Affairs. I think this is your, your first meeting. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank all the Austin P team that's wearing your name tags, because I think that is a critically important thing. A lot of times that we don't don't really think that much about. You know, you got uh, Leonard. How many new people have you met since you've been here at Austin P? Uh, a lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you stop to think about it, the uh, that name tag is, is so important to to the uh, all the team members here. You don't. You don't know everybody on campus, and when you see somebody, you see you've got something in common if you've got that name tag on. Next, it's really important to students. You know, you're not a face when you've got a name tag on. They know exactly who you are. But I think something some recognize is when you're out in the public, when you're out in Clarksville, Tennessee, or any other place that you are, and you, you're 
wearing your, uh, it's not just Friday red that you're wearing your red, but you've got your Austin P name tag on. Uh, that shows the presence of Austin P in this community. And I think that's under-recognized uh, the, the impact that Austin P has on the local economy here in Clarksville. And uh, I just encourage you to, uh, to make sure that everybody wears those, wears those name tags so, so everybody around here knows exactly who you are. And therefore, you're also accountable for your actions, right? <laughs> yeah. The last thing I'd like to say about President Macari is that uh, if for any reason another university tried to lure him away, I want it on public record that my name will be on the post office wall. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, any any other uh, uh, questions for Dr. Lacari? Okay, that concludes our agenda. As a reminder, our next regularly scheduled meeting will take place December 8th, 2023. I move that the meeting adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a moving and a second. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks so far.